Hello, my name is Daniel Loeb. I write under the name of BW Prudence. And the reason I'm making this video today is because on social media, I'll often come in contact with people that come from Christian backgrounds. What I want to do is give Christians that are just being introduced to the tarot a background about the tarot and some of the Christian aspects that are in it. The tarot originated as a card game played in Christian societies. And then over time, it developed into a system of mysticism as a cultist and Rosicrucians started adding their own symbolism and stuff and encoding it into the tarot. And we'll discuss all of that throughout this video. Okay, let's get started. The tarot, divination, and Christianity. The card presented here shows the lover's journey, which is just one of the Christian symbolisms and stories that's told throughout the tarot. At the top left of the card, you can see the lover's card in the Rider Waite deck, and it shows Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with the trees of knowledge and the tree of uh, life on the other side. There's an angel there, which some people will assume is Raphael, because in the Book of Tobit, he is the angel that brings the couple together. But other people will interpret the angel as Rizal, which is the angel of secrets, under a Kabbalistic belief that once Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, that God sent the angel Rizal to give them the Kabbalah as a way for mankind to restore its place in the universe and return, and return to the Garden of Eden. To the right of the lover's card is the devil card, which shows Adam and Eve at their fallen state at the lowest point when they were pointing fingers at each other and blaming each other. And it shows Eve sneaking the forbidden fruit, which according to the Book of Enoch was actually more like a, one of the line of grapes and was not an apple as in pop culture will usually portray it. At the bottom left shows the Two of Cups, which is shows Adam and Eve as the lovers start coming back together and working together and being an equal partners. And there's other cards that are not included in this that show their story progressed throughout uh, the tarot. But then the final card is Judgment, shows them successfully being uh, called up to heaven on the Day of Judgment. So thinking about the Bible and divination, the Bible does not say that you can't read tarot cards. Tarot cards are not mentioned in the Bible. They weren't invented for thousands of years until after the Bible had been written. There is some passages that say you should, that warn the Israelites not to take on the practices of the other nations as they were going to the promised land. But those were talking about nations that were sacrificing their children to demons or to false gods and stuff in order to gain, you know, material gains on the earth and stuff. So whatever it was they were doing for divination, it was not divination that we practice today or that most people practice today. So the tarot is a, used as cardomancy. It was originally a game, but cardomancy is using cards to, uh, cardomancy is using cards in order to tell a future basically, or help you to make decisions or process information. And in divination, it was used as a technique to get information from the divine. The Israelites throughout the Bible cast lots. The high priest would use a Urim and Thummim to get divine guidance from God. If it wasn't for Joseph interpreting dreams in Egypt, there wouldn't even be a Bible because the Jews would have died a long time ago. The cult tarot was made by Rosicrucians, which were Christian mystics such as Alephus Levi, A. Way, Papist, or uh, Oswald Worth. These Rosicrucians took a card game that was played within Christian societies and encoded symbolism from alchemy and the Kabbalah into it. And they coded within it the secret wisdom of the ages. The word occult means secret or hidden. An arcana, which the tarot is divided into major and minor arcana, refers to mysteries. The reason that things are considered occult is because they had to be practiced in secret. 
just as Jesus and the apostles remained outside of the major cities during his time because of persecution, the same thing has happened for anyone that disagreed with the church forever. So a popular number from the book of Revelation is 666, which John took the John took the different categories of Roman numerals and altogether they spell 666, which was John's way of pointing to Rome as the place where the false church was going to rise. So once the persecuted church became the persecuting church, it ceased to be the church of God. And anybody who had practices that differed from the dogma of the church risked being martyred or burned at the stake or executed for being a heretic. So in order to have you know, freedom of religion or freedom to worship God as you saw fit, you had to keep your practices secret and understanding the mysteries of God was hidden for only a few people. So for the Rosicrucians and Christian mystics during the times of persecution, they encoded their symbolism and concealed it from the masses and hid them within images and symbolism that were encoded into the tarot. What's presented on this slide is a short overview of how we obtained the freedom of religion that we have now. It started with a Martin Luther posting his 95 thesis, which is the Protestant Reformation, which isn't really a break from the orthodoxy, but the first steps towards resistance of it. And then Michael Servitas, a few years later, he wrote a book called the on the heirs of the Trinity, and he tried restoring Christianity back to its teachings from the Bible and away from church dogma. And as a result of that, he was burned at the stake by John Calvin. In response to that, Sebastian Castiello wrote his work on concerning heretics, suggesting that whether you think the person is right or wrong in their dogma, we don't have the right to just kill other people because they believe something different than us. And then John Locke later wrote a letter of toleration concerning heretics on the same, under the same lines of that, whether the person's a heretic or not, you have to give people time and you have to let people explore their spirituality and learn to worship God according to their own conscience. And John Locke's principles of government laid the foundations for what the Founding Fathers of America picked up, and the Founding Fathers secured freedom of religion within the First Amendment of the Constitution so that everybody is free to worship or not worship God according to their own consciences. According to Jesus, the greatest commandment was to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And the second was to love your neighbor as yourself. Later on, Paul wrote, what business is it of mine to judge those who are outside of the church? Who are you to judge, mother, who are you to judge another man's servant? Before his own master, he stands or falls. So when thinking about freedom of religion, you have to let everybody coexist. When dealing with freedom of religion, it's important to tolerate each other and allow everybody else to express their own views. They don't have to agree with you because everybody is on their own spiritual journey and we're all coming from different places. The alchemical axiom solve et coagula means separate and recombine. And it's part of the alchemical process where the different aspects of the body, mind, and soul are broken down and re and purified and then re-put back together. The cards I've selected on this slide are all from the Rider Waite deck, and they all show the mountain of God in the background. But everybody is looking at the mountain of God from a different angle and from a different distance and from a different perspective. And this is symbolic of our spiritual journeys that each of us are on. We're all going towards the same mountain, but we're coming from different directions. So 
we can't expect somebody to be on the exact same path and to know the exact same things that we do because we're all coming from a different angle. We start our pursuits at different ages in our lives and from different cultures and different places on the planet. But if we're going towards the same mountain, then our destination will be the same. It's just where we're starting from. So we can't expect that everybody is going to be at the same place as us. And the center images on this is uh, the drawing of Baphomet made by Alethus Levi, which now uh, all kinds of other groups, including the Church of Satan, have borrowed that as their symbolism. But originally, Alethus Levi drew his Baphomet based off of Heinrich Conrad's Rebus, which is the image right next to it. And both of them are talking about uh, alchemy and the symbolism of uniting the opposites of the sun and the moon or male and female, which is apparent in both Levi and Conrad's art. That is also the same symbolism that's on each of these cards where it shows Adam and Eve as the male and female that need to be combined. On the top right, it shows the Shekinah or white queen and the lion of the tribe of Judah as the male and female positive, like spiritual forces together. And on the left is got temperance, which is the angel of the Lord balancing out the uh, opposite polarities to, by the different cups. And then again, at the bottom right, the star card shows the Shekinah doing the same thing and balancing out the balance of nature, which is uh, represents like rain and water evaporating from the ponds and then getting re-poured back down and coming back into the main body of water through a streams that are rivers. So the main point I'm going to take away from this slide is that everything that we're doing is our own personal spiritual journey. We have to solve and coagulate, which I'm using here to refer to considering information, extracting the positive and the wisdom out of information and coagulating and gathering a body of knowledge of spiritual growth as you progress towards the holy mountain from whichever angle that you're coming from. Everybody needs to have the freedom to solve these mysteries themselves and to figure out what the spirit is teaching them individually in order for them to grow. Gorolot is casting lots. It's a Hebrew word and it means fates. The quote here at the top is from the book of Proverbs, which says, the lot is cast in the lap, but the decision is holy from the Lord. And this is how the average Israelites would use casting lots in order to make decisions. Where the high priest would use the Urim and the Thummim and the breastplate of judgment to make decisions, the normal citizens of Israel and later on the apostles would use just casting lots. An example of this would be in the New Testament, the apostles used casting lots in order to select Matthias as the 12th disciple. The original king of Israel was chosen by casting lots. Casting lots was the method used to divide up the land among the 12 different tribes of Israel. And the high priest used lots to determine the goat for the sacrifice on which one would be for the Lord and which one would be the scapegoat to carry off the sins to the desert. In this photo, wood lots are used with Hebrew letters burned on them. The Kabbalah focuses heavily on the Hebrew alphabet. The Sifra Yetzirah is the book of creation, and it's one of the first Kabbalistic texts, and it provides a mystical interpretation of the book of Genesis. Within it, it talks about the different Hebrew letters and divides them into three different sections. The three mother letters, which are also associated with primordial elements of air being the balance between fire and water. And then they have double letters because they each make two different sounds. And then they have single letters, which are letters that just make a single sound. In addition to these phonetic properties, each letter has its own meaning and is associated with the 
word, such as door or camel. Hebrew does not have a separate numbering system, so each letter is also associated with a number. In gematria, the values of words are calculated, and other words that have the same values are said to be related to the other word. And using the practice of gematria, Kabbalists can use an either individual words or entire verses of the Bible to, the Bible to uncover mysteries and secrets hidden within the text. The Kabbalah is made up of three pillars. The middle pillar represents balance, and it would be associated with air, which is the balance between fire and water. The left, the left pillar is associated with the male polarity and with fire, and it re represents learning through struggles and learning through facing adversity. The right pillar is also known as the pillar of mercy, and it's associated with uh, female polarity and learning through contemplation. The middle pillar is the balance that balances justice and mercy or fire and water, which is balanced by air. There's also four worlds of the Kabbalah, which starts with conception or emanation and then creation, formation, and then action. And this is how any goal or any process is set up. That first you come up with your idea, you create a plan, you start putting the plan into practice and everything starts to take shape. And then you're able to have the action realized and your plan come to fruition. The Kabbalah is made up of 10 sephirot, which are these 10 circles, and they represent different emanations or properties of God that we each have within ourselves also. The paths connecting the Sephiroth are associated with the 22 major arcana of the tarot or the 22 different letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The Rosicrucians wrote their first manifesto in 1614. And in it, they mentioned a mysterious oracle that they would consult that they referred to as the Rota Mundi. And as you can see from the quote, the Rota Mundi is associated with the woman wisdom because it says, for our Rota takes her beginning at the day that God spoke fiat, which would be fiat lux or let there be light. So, and since having a female Holy Spirit would be considered heresy to the church, they had to keep their practices secret, which is the reason it's called the occult. We don't know for sure that the original Rota Mundi of the Rosicrucians was the tarot, but that is what has been speculated by later Rosicrucians, such as Alephus Levi. Alephus Levi was an occultist and a magician who studied to be a Catholic priest, but later became a Christian deacon. He was interested in the Rosicrucians, and he studied alchemy and Kabbalah. In his Elements of the Kabbalah, he taught one of his students to get a tarot and pointed out the tarot's connections to the Kabbalah. He wrote of the connection between the 22 Hebrew letters and the significance of the numbers 1 through 10, which represent the 10 Sephiroth of the Kabbalah, and the connection of the four sets of pip cards within the minor arcana of the tarot. Levi viewed the tarot as being connected to the 32 roads or the 32 paths of wisdom of the Kabbalah. He also recognized the symbolism in the tarot from the books of Ezekiel and the Revelation of St. John. He points out that the tarot is also known as the Rhoda or the wheel and his belief that the ancient Rosicrucians knew it well. Levi believed that the tarot is an oracle contained a complete system of mysticism that embodied both Kabbalah and alchemy and all of the religion of the Torah. He viewed it as a modern replacement for the Urim and the Thummim, which he believed that the oracle of the Hebrews could be comprehended in modern times. The Urim and Thummim means lights and perfection, and they were two stones that were used in combination with the breastplate of judgment that the priest wore in order to divine the will of God. This image shows an example of the breastplate of judgment and lists the 12 sons of Jacob. Each of the sons has specific attributes associated with them 
that are the result of the blessings that both Jacob and Moses gave to them and the meanings of their names, which their mothers gave them at birth. So the breastplate of judgment provides 12 different attributes, which might be comparable to the 12 different zodiac signs used in astrology. I've also written a book that describes how to use the Urim and Thummim and the breastplate of judgment as an oracle, but that's not the topic of this video. The minor arcana of the tarot is divided into four different suits. The paragraph at the bottom of the screen shows Alethus Levi's concept of the four suits of the tarot being linked to the four items that were stored within the Ark of the Covenant. He also connected the four items in the Ark of the Covenant to the four letters that make it the name of God that's referred to as the Tetragrammaton, or the name of four letters. The Yud, which is the letter Y in Hebrew, is associated with the rod or the staff of Aaron, which God gave to Moses and which he used to perform miracles and to free the Israelites from Egypt. The letter He, or H, is associated with the cup. And in the Ark of the Covenant, there was a cup that held the manna that was collected from heaven. As you can see in the Ace of Cups card, the Holy Spirit or the Shekinah, the spirit of wisdom, is delivering the bread from heaven and placing it into the cup. The, the next letter in the Tetragrammaton is the letter Vav. And in the Ark of the Covenant, it represents the two tablets of the Ten Commandments which represented both blessings and curses. The final hay in the Ark of the Covenant represents the manna from heaven or the bread from heaven, the blessings of God. And these four different items in the Ark of the Covenant represent different attributes of each of the tarot suits. The yud represents spiritual endeavors or chosen endeavors. The first hay represents passions and pursuits and love. The Vav represents challenges and growing and learning through facing adversity. And then the final hay represents worldly achievements and can represent either your stewardship on earth or the blessings that God gives you. The Tetragrammaton is these four letters, yod hey vav hey, which is a conjugation of the verb to be with the prefix yud being added to it to represent a future tense of he. So that the name means he will exist. The Tetragrammaton can be found in some of the tarot cards, such as on the temperance card, it's right above the triangle on the angel of the Lord. And within the wheel of fortune card, they have the T-A-R-O-T -T for tarot written on it. There's Christian symbolism throughout each of these cards. Starting from the left, we'll look at the temperance card. The male triangle represents the three top sephiroth of the Kabbalah. Above, above that is the name of the Tetragrammaton, or the name of God written on his heart. And on his head is the symbol of the sun or of gold. He's balancing the male and female polarities or opposites of justice and mercy between the two cups. And in falling in the water, you can see that there was a river of gold that leads back to Eden, which represents the river Pishon, which flows out of Eden and has gold in it. The alchemical pursuit is to follow the river of gold back to Eden and to the mountain of God, where they receive the crown of righteousness or Keter of the Kabbalah, which is the top sphere and represents the return to heaven. On the Wheel of Fortune card, you have the angel or man, the eagle, the lion, and the ox, which represent both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or the four Gospels or the four living creatures that are found in both the books of Enoch and the Revelation of John. Within it, you have the tarot. You also have yod He vav He, which is a tetragrammaton written around the wheel. 
and inside it you have the alchemical symbols for sulfur, mercury, salt, and then you have the prima materia, which represents the three substances of alchemy, with the salt representing the body, the spirit, and the prima materia representing the Holy Spirit, and then the sulfur representing the soul. The card shows the gospel of God sent out into the world, but it has the Egyptian sphinx, the Hermonibus, and the serpent representing the false religions of the world that you have to be able to sift through in order to find the wheel or the law of God. And the card is about trying to understand the cycles and providence of God operating within the world but while looking past the false religions that distract you. The hermit card represents Moses, and he holds the rod of Aaron or the staff of Moses. Within his lamp is the star of David, which is a symbol of Judaism and the Jews being the lights to the world. He stands on white ground, which represents the manna from heaven. The key to the tarot is found on the Wheel of Fortune card and is used by several of the Rosicrucians that help develop the tarot. You have the T at the top. R at the bottom, A and the O. So it's reading it clockwise, it spells tarot. Reading it counterclockwise spells Torah, which refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, also known as the Law of Moses. Hebrew is read from right to left. So reading from right to left, you would read Torah. But English is read from left to right, so you would read tarot. And occultists would sometimes encode words backwards and stuff so that people could figure that out. Another aspect of the Wheel of Fortune is read starting with the R and read in a clockwise manner to read the word rota, which is Latin for wheel. The rota mundi is the Wheel of Fortune, which is the oracle that the original Rosicrucians used. The letter T at the end of the word Torah replaces the letter H to represent possessiveness. So Torah Moshi means the Torah of Moses. So the T makes it an of. But when read from left to right, it would read tarot. So within the Wheel of Fortune, you have the Torah of Yehovah or the Torah the nine, the law of God. Or you could have the Rhoda or the wheel of God. All of the letters, both of the words tarot and of Yehovah, form an eight pillared wheel, which is also the symbol for spirit. The key to the tarot based on the tetragrammaton started with the Lethus Levi and his wheel of Ezekiel, where he put the symbols of salt, sulfur, and mercury in it with the yud -Hey, vav -Hey, along with tarot on the outside and the four living creatures from the wheel of Ezekiel or the chariot of God. Postal had a similar key which had tarot written on it and Pappas later added to Levi's key so that he included the cups, the staffs, the swords, and the pinnacles in it to represent the tarot. Until finally A. E. Way put it together in his Wheel of Fortune card in his deck. Here is an example of how the Tetragrammaton and the systems of Pappas and Way and Levi all fit onto the Kabbalah. So the Yud right here would match up with Keter, which is the crown. The two Hays would be divided among the two pillars of the pillar of severity and the pillar of mercy, or the male and the female pillars action and contemplation. And the Vav, which is used as a connecting word, would represent the night, or it would represent the Messiah that connects the Father with the disciples, or the page of the night. So we have the Tetragrammaton can be read in a circular manner, or it could also be read as Yod, He, with these two together is the first hay, the vav, and the hay so that it's read vertically. 
These are also connected to the three mother letters of the Sifr Yetzirah, where the Aleph is the air, which would represent the top Sephirah, and fire, and water. In Gematria, the values of Hebrew letters are added to themselves in order to produce a reduced value, so that 10, representing the 10 Sephiroths, or emanations of God, would equal one plus zero, which equals one. So although God is represented by 10 different attributes, he is still one God. They also add up the values of everything within a word together to get a value of the word so that the value 26 and any words that have a similar value will in some way be related to the name of God. And this, of course, could be reduced for as 2 plus 6 equals 8, which would represent the 8th Sephiroth of Hod, which means eternity and would represent heaven, or the glory of God. Now we're going to look at each of the letters of the Tetragrammaton individually. Starting with the Yud, the pictogram of the letter has one arm pointing up and the other one pointing down, which is similar to the tarot where we have the left point pointing up towards heaven and the right point pointing down towards earth. Having the magician serve as a link between heaven and earth or being God's representative on the earth. The tetragrammaton of the name of four letters as stated earlier is the third person future tense of the verb to be. When God introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush, he introduced himself with an aleph at the beginning for Achea, which would mean I will exist. So when God is speaking about himself in the first person, he used the word Achea. But when he told Moses, go and tell the Israelites my name, he told them to call him Yehovah, which uses the third person future tense of the verb to be. So the value of Yod is 10 and the value of Aleph is 1. Both of these letters are used as the first letter in the name of God in either the Tetragrammaton or Achaia. And within Hebrew, 10 equals 1 plus 0, which equals 1. So they are both connected through a geometrical value. The letter He represents the spirit and is associated with the breath. The letter He represents a spirit and is associated with breath because the sound of a strong exhale. And it also represents a window because the indwelling spirit or the Shekinah provides you a window into the mysteries of God. On the Kabbalah, the Shekinah represents both the primordial fire and water in the Sefer Yetzirah. On the Rider Waite tarot, the high priestess represents the Shekinah, or the woman wisdom, the Holy Spirit, dwelling within the holiest of holies of the tabernacle. The outside of Solomon's temple had pillars named Boaz and Yakin, which means God is my strength, he will establish. They're also associated with David and Solomon. The Shekinah holds the Torah, or the tarot, Depending on, which, depending on which way you look at it. And the curtain to the holiest of holies has pomegranates in the shape of the Kabbalah. The female divine presence is represented by the moon, which is a reflection of the sun, just as the Shekinah is a reflection of God. On the strength card, the Shekinah is shown as the white queen, supporting the lion of the tribe of Judah. The woman wisdom represented by the hay, or the second letter of the Tetragrammaton, represents God's first creation. This image was created by Robert Flood, and it shows the Holy Spirit being the breath of God when he says fiat, or let there be light, and the Holy Spirit represented by a dove spreading light out as the world is created. The Vav is the third letter in the Tetragrammaton, and it means nail or tent peg. And would represent the post that held the tabernacle or tent up 
that contained the Holy of Holies, that the Shekinah or Holy Spirit dwelt within. Just as Jesus served to help set up the church and provide people access to the Holy Spirit. The Vav is the product of the Yud and the He being added together. The Yud, 10, and the He, 5, equals 1 plus 0 plus 5, which is 6, which is the value of the Vav. And it represents the Messiah doing the will of the Father with the aid of the Holy Spirit. The Vav is also used to form connections between words, similar to how we use the word and. So that the Vav is able to connect heaven and earth. The final He in the Tetragrammaton is the fourth letter. So if you have the King representing God, the He representing the Divine Feminine, the Vav representing the Messiah, the final He can either represent the Bride of the Messiah, also known as the Church, or it could be the Disciple of the Messiah, so that there's a King, the Queen, and then the Knight, and the Apprentice of the Knight, or the Page. The world card shows the Shekinah, or the woman wisdom, which represents the middle pillar of the Kabbalah. She holds two wands, which represent the other pillars of the Kabbalah, and she is the uniting principle, which unites them all. Around the outside of the card, you have the four living creatures of the book of Revelations and Ezekiel, or the four Gospels of the New Testament. The wreath the woman stands within represents purity and in the Middle Ages was a symbol of virginity. On the Kabbalah of the world card is right here, which would represent the Shekinah or the Holy Spirit being sent from Jesus to his disciples to help them to climb up the middle pillar. As discussed earlier, the court cards of each suit is also associated with the Tetragrammaton, with the king being associated with the Yud, the queen with the hay, the bob with the knight, and the page or the squire with the final hay. These cards are taken from the Rotomundi Terra, which shows a tetragrammaton in the form of a man with his arms, torso, and legs, with the yud representing his head. And it also shows the connections between alchemy of the soul, the spirit, the body, and the work of the alchemist. In the chemical wedding, the Shekinah, or the white queen, unites with the red king, which represents the soul of the alchemist, and begins the great work within his body, which the alchemist uses a salt et coagula process in order to purify both his body, mind, and spirit. In Christian mysticism, they also have the pentagrammaton, which adds the Hebrew letter shin, which represents fire or the anointing of the Holy Spirit to the divine name so that it spells Yahshua or salvation, which is a Hebrew spelling of the name Jesus. In Heinrich Kuhnrin's drawing of the cosmic rose, he presents Christ as a cross within a rose with the letters yud He shin vav He around it to spell Yahshua. Heinrich Conrath released this drawing only a few years before the Rosicrucian manifestos started surfacing. And this is what most likely influenced their symbolism. The later Kabbalistic order of the Rosen Cross also used the pentagrammaton to show the difference between Adam and Eve and Samuel and Lilith, or good and evil. The tarot is derived from a card game which could have any number of cards. But what goes by the term tarot now refers to a 78 card deck. 78 divided by 3 equals 26, which is the value of the tetragrammaton. 78 is divided by 3 because it represents the three different aspects of the occult tarot, which are the major canna, the core cards, and the pips. The major arcana represents the connecting paths and is associated with the 22 Hebrew letters. The minor arcana of the tarot represent the 10 sephiroth of the Kabbalah, 
with the pit cards numbered from one to 10 and the court cards representing the tetragrammaton. The minor arcana are also divided into four suits which represent the four different aspects of the tetragrammaton with stats representing the male polarity, chosen endeavors or goals. It's usually associated with wands and wands are used as a means of manifesting the magician's intent. Similar to how Moses used his staff to perform miracles in Egypt. Cups represent the female polarity. They're often associated with the womb and they deal with matters of love, emotions, and relationships. The Vav represents a sword. Swords are used for defense and swords are used in conflict. So the suit of swords represents conflict, challenges, and adversity. The final hay is associated with the pentacles, which is a five-pointed star and would be associated with the pentagrammaton or the bread from heaven, which is represented by Christ. Pentacles are also associated with coins, so it could be financial matters or doing business, or it could represent the blessings from God being bestowed upon you. Now that you have an understanding of the structure of the cult tarot as developed by Rosicrucians, I'll briefly give you an overview of some of the decks that I have made. The Tarot of the Most High is a deck that is based completely on the Bible. At the top, each card has keywords which summarizes the information on the card, making readings easy for beginners. The cards can also be used for meditative purposes because they each have Bible verses related to the subject matter of the cards. If you're familiar with the stories of the Bible, the symbolism of this deck will be easy to understand. Another one of my decks is Wisdom's Chariot. This deck is based on images that were created by Christian mystics over the centuries. And although the content isn't directly out of the Bible, the concepts are still Judeo-Christian in nature. The Alchemistic Woodcut Tarot is my deck published by Red Feather, and it includes original woodcuts that were created by Christian mystics, magicians, alchemists, and Kabbalists over the centuries. And the book provides a description of how the secret wisdom of the ages developed over the centuries. The Rotomundi Tarot is my next book and deck, which is going to be coming out in June of 2021. And it combines the concepts taken from alchemy, Kabbalah, and Rosicrucianism into an understandable system so that beginners can have a deep understanding of the tarot and adepts can gain a better understanding of the mysteries of God. I also have other books, including the one on the Urim and Thum, or books that teach hypnosis, as well as guidebooks to each of my decks. The Alchemistic Woodcut Tarot and the Rotomundi Tarot are sold to Schiffer Publishing, and the Rotomundi Tarot is available for pre-order right now. And the Tarot of the Most High and Wisdom's Chariot are print-on-demand tarot decks, which can be ordered through MakePlayingCards.com.